Glenn Greenwald is on the line with us from Salon.com. Uh, Glenn, welcome back to the Young Turks. Great to be back. <laughs> All right. Now from you, the far left. <laughs> from the far left, 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 lefter, as Orrin Hatch said. All right. Uh, so uh, you and, uh, and Larry Lessig have been beefing. Uh, have you guys... Uh, Done a man hug and hugged it out and, and resolved it, or well, we've yet? we've done a we've done a virtual one. I mean, you know, I I think Larry Lessig. I actually have a lot of respect for him, and we've worked together on um, issues in the past and and have a lot of agreement. Um, we've actually had debates in the past as well where we've disagreed over Citizens United, but it's been pretty constructive. We actually did that on your show. Um, so you know, I think. Um, one of the things to realize is that Elena Kagan has a lot of friends and a lot of people who uh, are her colleagues and know her for a long time, and, and Larry Lessig is one of them. So the debate over Elena Kagan to you and I might be a sort of abstract discussion about um, whether this person should be on the Supreme Court, but when he hears criticisms of her, he hears criticisms of his friend, and I think that's part of what's driving it. But we're going to do a few more appearances and, and try and there, there are really constructive issues that need to be aired and debated, and so we're going to try and, and focus on those. So let's get the heart of it, Glenn. Uh, what is the problem with Elena Kagan? What, why, is, uh, why are you concerned about her selection? Well, the first part of it is, is that she has a, an extremely sparse record. It's almost impossible to know what she thinks about virtually anything. I mean, there's a few snippets here and there over the last 20 years that you can kind of try to piece together. Some signs are encouraging. Some are quite discouraging. But, over, but by and large, she's a person who has, as the New York Times editorial page put it today, uh, completely hidden her philosophical view of the world. Um, she has been more devoted to her career advancement than to taking a stand on any particular issue. Um, and Why do you say a, that? I, I'm going to stop you right there. Why do you like? Give me a, a, some evidence or or an example of how why how she cared about her career advancement rather than taking a stand. Well, for, first of all, she's been in politics and um, academia for the last two decades, and yet you have to search high and low for her to have said something about anything. And usually what she says is uh, a little bit here and there about very technical legalistic issues that, that offend nobody. On the great controversies of the day, the great political and legal controversies of the day, she's completely stayed out of any of those discussions. And what's amazing is it's not just publicly that she has no record, but even her closest friends, Jeffrey Tubin at The New Yorker, has known her for 20 years, considers her a very good friend. He says he has absolutely no idea what she thinks about virtually anything, because she simply never expresses an opinion um, of any kind. And, you know, it's a pretty extraordinary attribute for just an ordinary American not involved in politics, never to express an opinion over two decades, but for somebody in her position in, in, in academia and, and in government to be such a blank slate, you really obviously have to make a concerted effort to do that, and that's what she's done. So now Larry Lessig would say, uh, and has said it in writing in a couple of ways. One, he says, look, there's actually, she has a, he said, quote, a corpus of work uh, when she got into, you, you know, when she was at Chicago uh, Law School, and that she had to do that to get tenure, et cetera, that you could look at that, and she's on the record on that stuff. And that number two, he says that he doesn't agree with Tubin. He thinks that, you know, that he's absolutely convinced as a friend that she is uh, uh, very progressive. Um, so apparently he, she shared it with somebody. I mean, I know that that's not good enough, but but do you also disagree with the corpus of work and and? Well, let me let me let me address both of those points. Yeah. First of all, um, you, you know, look at objective law professors, people who don't have a friendship with Kagan and therefore aren't objective and and aren't invested in the argument against Kagan, like I am. You can look to a whole variety of professors, all of whom I've linked to, who actually say that it's not just that she hasn't produced much written scholarship, but that it's actually mystifying that she was able to get tenure at the University of Chicago and then become a professor at Harvard Law School, given how little she's published. I mean, if you compare the amount that she's written to what, say, Cass Sunstein has written or Harold Coe or even just the average legal academician who has tenure at a major law school, it, it really pales. She has like two or three law review articles over the last 20 years that, that she's authored, and, and they're about very kind of um, neutral and, and inoffensive procedural and technical issues. And the claim from Larry Lessig that, well, look, I know her, and, and she's a good progressive, that would be relevant 
if he ever bothered to identify a single specific thing that she ever told him as part of this friendship that would lead you to believe that she really is a progressive, he, ref- he either refuses or doesn't have any specifics. He, it's, it's really more of a personal testimonial, wink, wink. If you knew her the way I knew her, you would like her. And, um, and, and, and I don't have to give you any specifics. You should just place your blind faith in, in my assurance. And but Glenn, when you're talking about somebody to go on the court for the next 40 years, that is not even close to good enough. But, Glenn, you know why he's doing it. It's because uh, our uh, nomination process for Supreme Court has become a farce. And so you have to hide your real opinions. And, and if perhaps that's why she hid her opinions for all this time. And so I have a problem with the whole process, right? And, and so... Yeah, but, 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 I, but let me interrupt you, because I, I don't actually... I understand that argument, um, but it's actually not true. And I'll tell you why it's not true. Um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg went before a Senate with a history of extremely liberal advocacy on abortion and civil liberties. She was at the ACLU. She was an abortion activist and was overwhelmingly approved. John Roberts and Sam Alito, nobody was confused about their positions. John Roberts was a Federalist Society activist. Sam Alito had 15 years of written opinion. And even Sonia Sotomayor gave all kinds of controversial speeches and, and left uh, almost two decades' worth of liberal judicial opinions. And she got confirmed relatively easily as well. So where is this evidence that unless you stay a blank slate and, and hide all of your views that you can't get appointed to, uh, confirmed to the Supreme Supreme Court, I, I just don't think that's true. Now, that's certainly the conventional wisdom that you have to be a blank slate, and we know that this administration loves conventional wisdom. So don't get me wrong, I'm not against you on that. But what I want to get to is the substance. From what little we do know, uh, is there things that concern you about her record? There are things that greatly concern me about her record, and I'll begin with what was the first red flag for me, which was when she was she appeared before the Senate Judiciary Committee to be confirmed as Solicitor General, and she had a colloquy with Lindsey Graham about the Pratt President's terrorism and war and terror policies, and he basically asked her a whole series of questions based on what he believes are the uh, President's powers as part of the war on terror, and she agreed with him to such an extent that by the end, he was flabbergasted at how completely she had embraced this right-wing worldview. And the New York Times said that, as a result, Republicans lavished her with as much praise as Democrats did during that process. One thing in particular that she identified as a belief of hers that she agreed with Lindsey Graham was that it isn't just people we find on a battlefield who we can detain as enemy combatants. I mean, the Supreme Court has said that's the case. That's not controversial. She went well beyond that and said that even people who we find far away from any battlefield and even people who haven't taken up arms against the United States but are distantly related to terrorism, like they're financing terrorism or they're accused of giving material support for terrorism. And the example was somebody that we find in the Philippines, somewhere there's no active war zone, Congress has an authorized force. We accuse them of uh, having to do with financing of terrorist groups. Can that person be held as an enemy combatant and detained indefinitely? And she said yes, because the whole world is a battlefield. That goes well beyond standard, current Supreme Court jurisprudence and was really one of the anchors of of Bush-Cheney radicalism. And, you know, I think the the important thing here is when you deal with somebody who has purposely avoided having much of a record, all you can do is pick out these little snippets and try to to discern as much meaning as you can from them. Um, So that's not perfect. She might have answers to put that into context, but at the very least, we need to hear them. Glenn, though, you know, you and I have tremendous problems with that statement of hers, um, but the president doesn't. He also believes that uh, we can hold people indefinitely as enemy combatants. So maybe he picked the right person for him. Well, but the, but this is the point is Justice Stevens doesn't believe that. And Justice Stevens has um, been probably the single most stalwart defender of individual liberties and imposing um, constraints on the executive's authority to override the Constitution in the name of terrorism. So I think you're right. I mean, part of why he likes Elena Kagan is because she will endorse the broad executive power theories that George Bush and Dick Cheney pioneered and that, and that Barack Obama has adopted. So the question then becomes for a progressive, what you have just said, if you're right, and I think you are, is that by replacing John Paul Stevens with someone like Elena Kagan in those views, what you will be doing is moving the court substantially to the right on critical questions. 
And had, did progressives work to elect Barack Obama in a large majority in the Congress? Did Democrats work for that same outcome in order to move the already very conservative Roberts Court even further to the right with this appointment? I think the answer is no. And, and while Barack Obama might be happy with putting someone like that on the court, he's not going to be president forever. Um, and I don't think progressives want to be moving the court to the right just to accommodate Obama's short-term desires to have strong executive authority. Glenn, in the really short time that we have, I really want to try to hit two other issues. Uh, one is uh, her view of executive power when she was in the Clinton administration. W what was that about? Because Lessig says, no, that was just, uh, if the Congress gives the president power, well, then obviously he has the right to use it. Do you think that there's an important uh, distinguish, uh, something to distinguish that or no? I mean, if that's all it were, then she'd have no reason to write a law review article. Everyone knows that if Congress gives the president authority, he has it. The reality is there has been a debate over what happens when Congress doesn't give the president power over administrative agencies. How much control can the president exercise? And the Reagan administration wanted the president to have more control because there was a Democratic Congress, and they wanted to let Reagan deregulate and dismantle the regulatory state, and they invented these theories of unitary power that that said that because the administrative branch is part of the executive, the administrative bodies are part of the executive branch, the president has those authorities. When she was in the Clinton White House, she expanded that wildly because there was a Republican Congress, the Gingrich Congress, and Clinton wanted to have a much more robust regulatory policy, and so they expanded these broad executive powers to say that the president um, had more control. People in the Democratic Party characterized Kagan's Law Review article as reflecting a very robust view of executive authority. It's not the Bush-Cheney theory that came after that, but it does indicate her, her view in separation of powers that she's a very pro-executive power jurist to the extent that we can know her philosophy at all. And finally, on the First Amendment issues, she wrote uh, about that as well. What's controversial about her positions there, if any? I mean, I'm a First Amendment absolutist, and I have to say, I haven't found her First Amendment writing to be all that bothersome. Jonathan Turley, who's also a First Amendment uh, absolutist, finds it very disturbing. Um, she does justify more government regulation of free speech and for greater la with greater latitude than I would like. Um, and I'd like to hear a lot more about what she thinks about the First Amendment, but I think her writings were pretty much in the mainstream of, of First Amendment jurisprudence debate at the time, and, and I'm not that worried about um, the things she's written in that regard. So it looks like executive power is the main uh, problem then? As well as all the other areas that we have no idea what she <laughs> thinks about because we've never heard from her. All right, fair enough. Glenn Greenwald from Salon.com, uh, certainly uh, a writer that everybody's uh, reading in regards to Ilana Kagan, uh, very interesting insight into it. Thanks so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Always a pleasure.